If you remember our song, we'll sing it together. This is just the first stanza tonight. Let's work on it together. His road for mine, a wonderful exchange. Clothed in my sin, I suffered with God's rage. Draped in his righteousness, I'm justified. In Christ I live, for in my place he died. I cling to Christ, and marvel at the cross. Jesus forsaken, God is strange from God. But thus it's not, my life is not my own. My praise, my shall be fair Christ alone. Very good. How many of you have never heard that song before? Can I see your hands? Where were you? We just sang it. <laughs> That's that's why I had the quick pastor, and I just ran out of jokes, you know, and I had to had to find a new church to be able to tell my jokes in. Uh, let's go back and sing it again for those of you that it's new to. And um, I love this song. I love both the uh, tune. I think it's very pretty, but I love the words. Uh, being able to just see uh, very deep doctrine in such beautiful. Uh, articulation. Let's go ahead and sing it together. His robes for mine, a wonderful exchange. Clothed in my sin, I suffered with God's rage. Draped in His righteousness, I'm justified. In Christ I live, for in my place He died. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cross. Jesus forsaken, God is trained from God. But by such love, my life is not my own. My grace, my all, shall be fair, Christ alone. Very good. We're going to start each evening with a challenge. Now, a challenge is different from a sermon because sermons are longer than challenges are. Uh, sometimes ser sermons can be quite challenging, but I used to call these my faith sermonettes. But I found out that Christians, you know, it, they, they say that sermon are preached to, uh, sermonettes are preached to Christianettes who go out and smoke. So I, I decided that... We'll, we'll not do that. Um, so this is just a, a, a challenge. The reason I talk about faith, there's, there's a lot of ways we could, I love to call the life God asks us to live, the Christ life. I love that Christ, uh, the hope of glory inside of me. Um, when, when I am talking a certain way, I, I can see that's not Jesus. Does that make sense? I mean, that's, that's not the way he talks. And then I can recognize that's the flesh, not the spirit. So the spiritual life is another way of saying it. I actually believe the life of faith is another way of saying it. Faith is the access to the power of the spirit. It's when you and I live in dependence. We don't own God's spirit. We don't be holy in order to be able to be fed. We are dependent. That's how we are fed. And so I want us to focus on this concept of faith. The Bible tells us right after the gospel is the power of God and the salvation and the just shall live by faith. It's after we are saved, it's faith. And I believe that when it comes to evangelism and discipleship, everything rides and falls on faith. Do we believe God? And I don't know if you've seen the little byline that I have up there. Our definition of faith is going to be shortened down to this little concept. Faith is believing God enough to step out on what he said. Now, there's a, uh, you, I don't know, how many of you know what that is? Good, it says right up there. Um, 
So I don't know if you knew this, but this animal can jump 10 feet in the air, 30 feet in distance, and yet it can be contained in a three-foot fence if the fence is opaque and there is a ditch on the other side of that fence. Because the African impala will not jump anywhere that it cannot see where his feet are going to land. And I think sometimes we Christians are like that as well. We aren't sure what's going to happen if we open our mouth and start talking to our friend about the Lord, and so we're not willing to take that leap of faith to be, and, and really what faith is, is trusting God enough to step out on what he said, not on what we see. And so we're going to have three, four different challenges on this concept of faith. Tonight, we're going to ask a question. What is real faith? And uh, I think you'll find it very helpful. I hope you recognize by the question, we're making an implication that some of what we call faith is not real faith. And then, tomorrow night, we're going to look at it from a different angle, and we're going to answer the question with this statement, real faith works. And that may be a little different than what you think, so you have to hold off. You know, it's one of those soul boys and girls. If you want to hear the rest of this, you have to come back tomorrow night. So uh, you'll want to be here tomorrow night for that. And then Tuesday night is kind of the, the uh, uh, climax of the whole a challenge because we're going to ask this very personal question, is your faith working? It's, it's actually making the application to each one of our lives. And then uh, we're going to end on Wednesday night with a challenge uh, and a pic look at a picture of courageous faith, faith that is courageous. So if you would turn to Hebrews chapter 11, that's where we're going to start tonight, Hebrews chapter 11. And in Hebrews chapter 11, God gives us picture after picture after picture of faith. In fact, some have called this the great hall of faith. And it's interesting, before we begin to walk down this hall and see picture after picture of faith that God shows us, he stops to give us a definition of faith. And that's what we want to look at tonight. Um, this is not a full-blown, everything that is detailed about faith kind of a definition. I like to think of this as the essence of faith. This is faith boiled down to its very essence, the powerful form of faith. So with that in mind, there are four things here that I want us to recognize. In verse 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hopeful. And this idea of substance is that it's real, it's substantial. And so really what it's saying is that faith is the reality of hope. We could say it this way, real faith always results with an attitude of hope. We could actually turn that around and say it this way, if you don't have hope, something is wrong with your faith. So when it comes to evangelism and discipleship, if you're thinking, I could never do this, I want you to recognize that the real difficulty is your faith. God wants you to trust him to do what he promised through your life. Then comes the real question, so what is hope? I don't know if you hear yourself saying this, uh, but uh, I would imagine that here in this city that is so beautiful and lush and green that uh, you probably say this often, boy, I hope it doesn't rain today. <laughs> and quite frankly, most of the time we say that, we're kind of half afraid that it is going to rain, aren't we? So the word hope is one of those words that we use a little bit uh, differently. Um, th this word is a picture word. Now, I'm a picture person. I kind of think in pictures. And so I love picture words. This one literally means to bend the neck. I agree. It's not quite enough information. When, when I was a kid, I lived at the end of a dirt road. 
And anybody who's ever lived at the end of a dirt road, you know, you can tell when people are coming a long ways away by that plume of dust that comes up. So if I knew my cousins were coming to visit, I would walk to the end of our driveway and I would bend the neck. And that's the picture of this word, hope. The idea is that I am anticipating what I am hoping for to come right around the corner. And the idea is that when I genuinely believe in God, then I am anticipating God doing what he said he would do right around the corner. So number one, faith is the reality of hope. Number two, faith is the convincement, excuse me, the conviction of the invisible. It is when I am convinced that what is invisible is real. I, the reason I say that is because I want you to recognize that faith is more than a mere acknowledgement of information. The faith is a conviction that moves people to action. You could say it this way. Faith is not just believing that God can. So we could ask the question tonight, how many of you believe that God can save your neighbor? And, and all of us would raise our hand. Of course we believe that. But that's not what faith is. Faith is not believing that God can. Faith is believing that God will through me to the point of stepping out on what God said. And frankly, until we take that step of faith, we haven't really exercised faith. So faith is the conviction of the invisible. So let me ask you, this is a little strange, are there any beings in this room that we cannot see? I see kind of... So if there are beings in this room that we can't see, what, who are they? Who, who, who's in this room that we can't see? I think angels are here. Good ones and bad ones. I believe that. But that is a little weird, so let's dust that off, okay? Is there anyone else in this room that we cannot see? God? The Holy Spirit. And where is God, the Holy Spirit? Is he zooming around up there somewhere? Where is he? Yeah, he's inside of every single one of us. I love this. It is a resident Savior. So we can believe that God, the Holy Spirit, is with us. Jesus, in the Great Commission, told us, and lo, I am with you all day even into the end of the world. And literally, he is saying in conjunction with my command to you to go win the world, don't worry about it, I'm with you. I was um, sitting in my office one day when I got a telephone call from a uh, man in our church, and he called and said, Pastor, I, I am really troubled. My son, Ross, he was a 35-year-old uh, young man, uh, is in the psych ward of the hospital. Would you please go see him with me? And of course, I said yes, went down with Jim and Brenda. And uh, Ross had told his wife that he was contemplating suicide. His wife had called someone in authority. Next thing Ross knew, he was in the psych ward. He was not a happy camper. And when he saw me with his parents, he looked at them and looked at me, and he said, what is he doing here? And he, he, he didn't want to see anybody. I sat down with Ross and began to talk to him. And I began to tell him, you know, Ross, one of the wonderful things about God is that God is holy. He's perfect. We can always count on God to do the exact right thing because he is perfect. He's holy. But the negative part of God's holy nature is that our sin separates us from him. And that begins to explain some of that emptiness and loneliness and fear and guilt that we all experience in our hearts. Ross was listening. And then I went on and told him, you know, the Bible tells us that not only is God holy, but that God is just. Now, everybody wants a just God, unless we're guilty. 
And the Bible tells us that God is perfectly just, and he can't overlook our sin, but he has to judge us. Well, Ross had had just about enough. And he looked at me, and with as much sarcasm as you can imagine, he said, how do you know that's true? And I said, well, Ross, that's easy. All I have to do is tell you. And I know that the Holy Spirit will be speaking to you in your heart and convincing you that these things are true. And so it's not like you're going to hear a voice out loud. It, it's like there's this voice in the back of your head saying, that's true. That's true, and you know it. And so you may even feel a squeezing or a tugging at your heart. By the way, have you ever sensed the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart that way? So you know how to explain that to your unbelieving friend. Ross looked at me, and he said, maybe that explains it. I said, explains what, Ross? He said, why I have felt so weird ever since you walked in here. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is the fragrance of Christ around a spirit-filled Christian. We know what a fragrance is. It's an invisible aura that impacts people whether they want to be impacted or not. And you and I can count on the Holy Spirit. Now, the, the reason I can count on it is not because I have this feeling of the Holy Spirit. I, I usually don't. It's because God said in his word that the Holy Spirit will be in the world convincing the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The very things that we're going to be talking about when we're explaining to people that God is holy and he can't tolerate sin, that God is just, he can't overlook sin, he has to judge it, and that Jesus Christ is righteous and wants to trade places with us and give us his righteousness. And we can count on the fact that the Holy Spirit will convince people of that truth because he's promised us that he will. You and I can speak from the Word of God believing that this is a self-authenticating book. The reason we can believe it is because the author promises to speak to people and tell them the truth about this book. And so I wish I could tell you that Ross got saved that night. He did not. But uh, the good news is the next evening he was able to leave the hospital. He went to his parents' house to spend a few uh, days and, and get uh, resituated. I went to his parents' house, sat at their dining room table with him, went through the rest of the gospel. And I have never seen anyone so violently enter into the kingdom of heaven. And you, you, you talk about tears rolling down a person's face. They weren't. They were splashing off the table. He cried for an entire half hour just sobbing. It started with tears of repentance and then uh, uh, replaced by tears of joy. And uh, he, he just couldn't believe what God had done in relieving the tension of his spirit. And you and I can be confident that what the Holy Spirit has promised us he will do in his word, he will do when we speak for him. So, number one, the Bible tells us that faith is the reality of hope. And then number two, that faith is the conviction of the invisible. And then number three, faith is the means to spiritual success. The Bible says, for by it, faith, the elders obtained a good report. And literally, the Bible tells us the way we make God happy is not by what we do, but by our depending upon him. We'll talk about that more in just a moment, and so let's move on. Lastly, in this essence of faith, we're going to see that faith is confidence aimed at the powerful Word of God. So, the Bible tells us, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. We call this ex nihilo. God spoke and the world existed. He created everything we do see out of nothing. God created everything with his Word. That's how powerful the Word of God is. He said, well, Jeff, I, I thought you were talking about the written word of God. That's the spoken word of God. You do realize that this is the spoken word of God written down. That's how powerful this book is. This book is God's word. 
sometimes we get this notion in our brain that faith is if I believe it enough, I can make it happen. And quite frankly, that's kind of a new age thought. That puts me as the creator. You see, what faith is, is faith says, if God said it, I can trust it. And he, the creator, makes it happen. That's what faith is. Faith is not based on what I want to happen. Faith is based on what God said in his word. And frankly, there are some things that I wish I could believe God for, but he's never promised me. And I think sometimes we get really disappointed when God didn't do what we wanted him to do, but God never promised that. But God does promise you can always count on. So, Faith is the reality of hope, it's the conviction of the invisible, it's the means to spiritual success, and it's confidence aimed at the powerful word of God. And then secondly, the Bible shows us in verses 4 and 5 what I call the establishment of faith. It's, we're going to see a pattern established in these two verses that goes on throughout the rest of the book, and the pattern is this, faith followed by an action verb. By faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. By faith, Enoch pleased God. By faith, Noah built an ark. By faith, Abraham took a journey. By faith, Noah's par or Moses' parents hid him. And over and over and over, we see that real faith is always followed by action. We'll talk about that more tomorrow night, so let's continue on. And in this last verse that we're going to look at tonight, verse 6, we're going to see what I call the essential of faith. And you'll see in the first part of this verse the necessity of faith. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. So what pleases God? Faith. Simple. It, it, sometimes I get this idea that I have to perform. I, I mean, I have to be at my best. How many of you feel like you are at your best 90% of the time? How many of you feel like you're at your best 1% of the time? I mean, you know, the fact is, if I, if I have to be at my best, I'm sunk, I'm in trouble. But the Bible tells us that God's strength is made perfect and weakness. This is not about me. It's not about my performance. It's not about my abilities. It's not about my devotion. This is about faith. I came to a crisis in my Christian life, and frankly, I got to the place where I didn't want to read my Bible anymore. It started to have it several years ago when we first got married, that every year, every morning, we would sit down and, and have a time uh, alone with the Word of God, and every year I would read through my Bible. And so we, we, we've been married a long time. So we've been reading the Bible through every year for a long time. And frankly, I got to the place where I, I, I didn't want to do it anymore. And I'll tell you why. Because I was reading the Bible thinking that my job was to figure out what God wanted me to do so I could do it. And I would get very discouraged. Because I, I wasn't even doing the stuff that I knew I was supposed to do, let alone trying to learn more stuff, and it just wore me out. And there's a truth that changed. I told you I, I have these lies that's, that swim in my head, and I have these mantras of truth that I try to keep myself straight with. And here's a mantra of truth that God gave me that I think just totally changed my life, and that is that my primary relationship with God is a receiving relationship. The fact is, friend, I don't do anything for God. He does everything for me. My primary relationship with God is a receiving relationship. But I realized that, frankly, it changed the way I read my Bible. I don't tell, I, I tell people, I don't read the Bible because I have to. I read the Bible because I have to. I mean, I, I need this book. And every day, you know what I do when I go looking in the Word of God? I look for who God is. Because when I see him in his faithfulness, it gives me purpose to trust. Because he is all in all. Everything I could ever need, everything I could ever want, everything that I could ever desire is all found in him. 
So that primary truth, my primary relationship with God is a receiving relationship. But those of us who've been around for a while realize that life is all about balance. And there's a balance in truth to that truth that is very, very helpful. And that is my primary relationship with everyone else is a giving relationship. So, so this is what that looks like. I, I look to God and I am totally dependent and he gives me everything I need. Now God is infinite and therefore I have plenty and so I can spend the rest of my day, the rest of my life, giving to all the people around me. So how does that work out in daily living? You probably know I live with that woman right over there. But we do it a little differently than most people do. We, we live with each other 24-7. I mean, bless her heart. She is stuck with me all the time. And we usually do it in a hotel room. So, I mean, we, we, we are together all the time. I know her really well. In fact, I, I kind of know what buttons to push. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> so there's a certain tone in my voice that I know when I use that tone, I can make her feel guilty. And when I make her feel guilty, I can get her to do what I want her to do. <laughs> And I know that when I hear that tone in my voice, two things are true. Number one, I'm hurting her. And number two, something's wrong with my relationship with God. God doesn't want me looking to her to meet my needs. God wants me looking to Him. He's promised to supply all of my needs. Faith is depending on Him. And, and, and when I believe that God is enough, then I have plenty to give. And my relationship with her is a primarily giving relationship. Now, God has met multiples of my needs in life through her. And I'm not saying that I don't need people. But my dependency is on him. He is my source. You do realize this. All of us are people of faith. Not a single person in this room lives without faith. The question mark is not, are you a dependent person? You can't breathe without God. The question is not, are you a dependent person? The question is, what are you depending on? What is your source? What are you looking to? So the Bible shows us here the necessity of faith. And then secondly, I, I love this, we see the access of faith. The Bible says, he that comes to God must believe. You see, faith is what connects me to God. Think about it this way. If you could imagine a, a fan right here, an electric fan, and uh, it's, it's a functioning fan, it's plugged in, there's plenty of electricity in the outlet, the cord is functioning, but the fan is not running. That would be the first thing you would check to figure out why that fan isn't running. You'd go find that switch. And I believe that switch is like our faith. You see, that switch is what connects the fan to the power in the, electri in the, in the electrical outlet. And it's, it's what allows the fan to access the power that is in the outlet. Now think about it this way. I am that fan. When God recreated me, he recreated me as a functioning Christian. <coughs> I am a functioning Christian. You are a functioning Christian. The Bible says that we were recreated after God in righteousness and true holiness. That everything I need to be able to please God is resident inside of me. But I have to acknowledge there's a lot of times my Christian life doesn't run very well. So what's the problem? There's just not enough grace for the likes of me. Isn't that it? Isn't that the problem? No, God's grace is infinite. I love the phrase, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, I was always a little underwhelmed by that word sufficient. I mean, I, I'd kind of like something a little more robust than sufficient. But the reason God uses the word sufficient is because it doesn't matter where the, what extremity you find, grace is more than enough. 
So the, the problem is not that God's grace isn't enough for me. The problem is that switch of faith. I am not connecting myself to God through faith. Faith is what gives us access to God. He that comes to God must believe. Faith is what allows me to connect to God. I like to think of it this way. Real faith connects us to a real God, and real grace shows up. And you can tell what a person is genuinely believing as to whether or not grace is showing up. Because God's grace always shows up when we depend on him. And then the last thing we're going to look at tonight in this challenge is the object of faith. It's really not about great faith. It's about faith in a great God. And there are two things that God tells us that we have to believe. Number one, we have to believe that he is. Some translations actually say believe that he exists. So how many of you believe that God is? Okay, so we got that one down, right? Kind of. Here's the deal. I know that God is. I know he exists. But sometimes I forget to put him in the equation. I live as if he were not. I like to call this practicing the presence of God. Living every moment realizing that God is right here, right now. Have you ever heard that song, When God is Near, All the World Seems Far Away? And the fact is that when God is near, when I recognize the presence of God, it changes everything. Let me see if I can put that practically. If you have a pornography problem, you have a presence of God problem. You've forgotten that God is right here, right now. If you have a gossip problem, a worry problem, I mean, you, you put it across the board. We have a presence of God problem. We've forgotten that God is here. God wants us to focus our attention every moment of every day on his presence. I love this. I don't ever have to live a moment without an awareness of his presence. And then number two, not only do I have to believe that he is, but I have to believe that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I don't understand, or I do understand, but we have so many promises in this book, and yet I find that the church as a whole tends toward apathy, lukewarmness. And I really wonder if part of the problem is that we have forgotten to focus on this concept of reward. And I, I really have become to believe that this concept of reward is important. Isn't it interesting that when God tells us, I'm going to simplify everything I want you to believe about me into two concepts, that I am and that I am a reward or a being that diligently seek him, I believe it's pretty important. You say, well, Jeff, I, I don't serve God because he does stuff for me. I serve him because I love him. I mean, it's called the great commandment. We're supposed to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. So I get that. But think about this. Does it have to be one or the other? I can't I love God with all of my heart and still be excited about the stuff he's promised to give us if we, if we serve him? And then I got another question for you. Who thought of this reward idea in the first place? And God uses it to motivate us. And think about this. The very last red letters in your Bible, if you have a red letter edition, are found in Revelation chapter 22, where Jesus Christ says, Behold, I come quickly. He says it three times in that last chapter of the book. And one of those three times he says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. Let me just see if I can give you a, an understanding as to why that's important. How many of you are motivated by more work? I mean, your boss comes in tomorrow morning and he brings a big stack of paperwork and lays it down on your desk and he says, look, I, I'm a little behind and I need you to get all of these files straightened up and all of the, the uh, work orders in here uh, taken care of this week and, uh, um, and he turns around to walk out. And you're looking at that stack of paper and you're thinking, whoo, 
this is awesome. I have more work. This is awesome. So how many of you are motivated by more work? Well, usually there's one or two in every crowd. That's a... But what if, as your boss turns to leave, and he says, oh, by the way, if you can finish that work by the end of the week, I'll double your salary for the rest of your life. <laughs> now, how many of you are motivated? Okay. You see, God built into human existence a motivation from reward. That's how God built us. And God wants us to believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith is the issue when it comes to evangelism and discipleship. Do we believe God enough to step out on what he said? Now, we'll continue this thought as the week goes on, but Anna is going to come, and uh, she's going to give us her story. And um, this is not about your story. I just to remind you, there, you have an announcement. I do have an announcement. Um, you were given a find five list, so I'm, I'm confident you got those in church, and I think that we actually have some on the back tables. But I well, would love for you to identify five people in your life who need the gospel and pray about those people. And then on Wednesday night, this is a large group, so I trust we get to this, but what we plan to do is on Wednesday night just spend a few moments praying through that list of five people with a partner here at your church. So make sure you do that. I just will warn you, tonight you're going to feel a little bit like um, you've got a whole lot more information that you can handle. So ask us questions. Please give us feedback. But we will be covering a lot of announcements, a lot of information tonight. We apologize ahead of time for that. So I want to tell you just a little story from my life. And it's just something that I think that there are, Jeff, Jeff and I have chosen stories that we feel are instructional. So I think there are things, elements in this story that will help you. Um, when God says to us, all things work together for good, this is an experience in my life where I saw that to be true. So if the only thing that was good that came from this experience is the story I'm going to tell you tonight, I know you would agree with me that it was totally worth it. So I had begun to have problems with my right arm, and they were significant. They were keeping me from doing some of the things in life that I really enjoyed doing. Jeff and I discovered that there was a surgery that would help me. We went into that surgery, we investigated it, we prayed about it. I actually, one of my brothers, is a he's, a, he's a surgeon at the University Hospital in Colorado, so he helped me to get the best hand surgeon in the whole state of Colorado. So I went in with high hopes, and I came out much worse than when I went in. Because even though I had the best hand surgeon, I had a resident anesthesiologist. He made, from man's perspective, he made a mistake. But from God's perspective, we know there are no mistakes. And so here I was with, basically, I couldn't use my right arm at all. It was, it was frustrating. It was difficult. The simplest things in life I couldn't do. I, I couldn't fix my hair. That's a big deal, right? So Jeff became my hair stylist. <laughs> I'll tell you, I married a perfectionist, and I know that. I used to think I was one till I married him, and I was, oh, they're cut above. <laughs> so what would take me maybe 15 minutes maximum would take Jeff a full 45 minutes. And when we were done, <laughs> he got out his favorite thing, which was hairspray. <laughs> because hairspray ensured that my hair was not going anywhere the rest of the day. <laughs> so... <laughs> Another thing that was challenging was just keeping up with my house, and it was discouraging. And Jeff said, Anna, why don't we find someone who can help us clean the house till we get back on our feet? Well, I was pretty excited about that. We had a neighborhood paper called The Honker. Now, if you were going to name a paper, would you choose The Honker? <laughs> In The Honker, there was an advertisement for a young woman 
named Rebecca, and that's what she did. She cleaned houses for a living. So we made this wonderful arrangement. She was young. She was in her um, mid-20s. She would come into my house full of energy, start at the top, and it seemed like just in the snap of a finger, she was at the bottom of my house on her way out the door. I loved the arrangement. But you know, as Rebecca would go through my house, I remember wondering, does she know the Lord? And I know you've been there before. But I was troubled. I wanted to give her the gospel, but I knew that she was on a very tight time frame. So if I kept her from giving, but if I, if I stopped her, gave the gospel, I would keep her from her next appointment. There were a lot of things about it that were difficult. I knew she wouldn't be primed to listen in that situation. So I prayed about it. God gave me a simple solution, which I can imagine you're already thinking through in your mind. What I did the next time Rebecca came to my house is I said, Rebecca, I would love to get to know you better. So next time you come, could you carve out extra time? And then I, I said, let's, I, excuse me, I asked her if she would carve out extra time so that she could have lunch with me. And then I said, Rebecca, there are some truths from the Bible that I would love to share with you, some things that have changed my life. I did that last part because I know I'm a big chicken. It's just like me to have this great ambitious idea that I'm going to share the, boss, the gospel with Rebecca, but under pressure, I might back out. So it was a commitment of sorts. That day came. We had a simple lunch, because remember, I can barely cook right at this time in my life. Simple lunch. Just really enjoyed getting to know each other. And when it was finished, I, I got out my Bible, and I began to go through the gospel with Rebecca. I still remember when I got to Revelation 21.8. That's a fearsome verse, if you don't know the Lord. I still remember, as I began to quote, what the Bible says, but the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderer, murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters, idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. I still remember as she looked down at that verse, she said to me, fearful? Her eyes are this big around. Unbelieving? That's me. And even though I hated watching the panic that was in her face, in my heart I was rejoicing because God was keeping his promise to me. He was convicting Rebecca of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So from that point on, it was very easy to express to her the matchless love of God and how we access that love through grace. So there, in the simplest of settings, Rebecca put her faith in Jesus Christ as her Lord and her Savior. Here's why I share that story with you. A lot of people say that there are obstacles to giving the gospel. They, they're in a situation where they can't witness. So a perfect example of that is work or perhaps team, team sports. You can't have your child out on the field playing football. You're running along the sidelines yelling, Go Johnny, and then witnessing to a person. It, it's just probably not going to work. But what you can do is what I did with Rebecca. I carved out a special time. I made it a social time, which is very disarming. To have someone at your kitchen table or to do coffee, that's a, that's a very enjoyable set setting. So that's what I did with Rebecca. And in the big scheme of things, the problem is that we're just so busy. But when I look back, I do not regret any of the time that I carved out to spend with Rebecca. It made an eternal difference in a human soul. So that's a thought for you. There's a second reason that Jeff and I share this story. You see, when I got the understanding that God used simple people like me, didn't have all the theological knowledge of my husband, to lead people to Christ, I got excited about that. And I began giving the gospel, and I began seeing people get saved, and that was exciting. But what I did not do in those early days, I did not disciple people. So there came a time when I no longer needed my house cleaned. Rebecca went her way. I went mine. I totally lost track of Rebecca. I am so ashamed of that. What I failed to do was disciple her. And I believe that the reason, without recognizing it, 
was that discipleship is work. I mean, some people think evangelism is hard, but the hard part is discipleship. It's the nitty-gritty hard work, and I never did that in those early days. I did not do that with Rebecca. I truly regret, regret that. But yesterday I shared with you my best friend in all the world is somebody I led to Christ. I discipled her. We taught her how to give the gospel. She joined us at least three times for Bible studies. And then yesterday I shared with you that eventually she led her adult daughter, and she has led others to Christ since then, making me a spiritual grandparent. So here's just a lesson that you can learn from my failure. When God gives you souls, and if you give the gospel enough, you will see people saved. Take time to disciple them, to teach them how to share the gospel. And in the long run, Jeff shared this, this morning, your influence, your gospel influence is going to be so much greater as you see God multiply souls. So this week we're actually going to give you two different tools that you'll be able to use in evangelism. One is the Exchange Bible Study. That's a full lesson Bible study that deals with the four truths. God is holy, God is just, God is loving, God is gracious. And the second is the one-time gospel presentation. And so we lovingly call this our GPS. Um, the GPS, uh, it, there's a couple... That's not a GPS up there. <laughs> it probably just crashed. You're going to have to try it again. That's a GPS up there. Okay, um, the GPS and the um, God's Exchange for You track kind of work together. Um, this is just an outline. Frankly, that's not a tract. So when you are going to use this piece, in fact, if you'd like to, I'd love for you to get that out. We're going to use it here in just a minute. So if you wouldn't mind finding it, it's going to look like this. And this is not a gospel track, so this is not designed for you to take and give it to someone. Um, this is a presentation system. It's designed for you to use it when you are presenting the gospel to someone. So how many of you feel like this is a pretty good idea? I think I'm going to like it, but boy, I am afraid I'm not going to be able to remember it. Yeah, I, that, I think that's a very legitimate concern because you've got all kinds of stuff in your brain. This is to help you stay on track, especially until you get it down really, really well. So the GPS is another tool that we're going to give to you. The app, and I've got the little picture of it down here in the corner, is another form of the exact same thing. So the, the app is kind of like those two pieces put together in one electronic piece. Now, you may want to get your app out and use it to explain the gospel to someone because it's certainly uh, what it was designed for. And so I just wanted you to be able to see all the pieces of that. Um, and then, if you take your book, Giving the Exchange, Giving the Exchange book is the one with the red arches on the front of it. If you'll turn to page 61, page 61 in the book, you will find the section 2. So this, is, in fact, 61 isn't on the page. It's, you just find page 60 and look across the page from it. Um, this is the beginning of section 2, and I just wanted you to see on page section 2, these four words, because our gospel presentation has four phases to it. The first phase is the conversation phase. Yesterday, we talked about how to have a compelling conversation. When we have a compelling conversation, we are able to take the conversation from surface to soul, 
then we're going to use that conversation to direct that conversation to the gospel. That's the whole purpose of this phase. So we call this the conversation phase. Then, we're going, once we ask them, can we show you who God is, we're going to then start what we call the introduction phase. The introduction phase does not mean, I'm going to tell you what I'm getting ready to tell you. I mean, when we think of introduction in a speech, we think, okay, this is kind of the beginning part. When we say introduction, what we mean is we are going to introduce our friend to God. Now, I don't mean um, God 101, and here's some information about him. I mean, he's a real person, and he impacts my life, and I'd like to introduce you to him, a real person who is knowable. So we're going to use those four gospel truths. God is holy, God is just, God is loving, God is gracious to be able to show them. And then, once we've given them the truth, we're going to invite them to put their trust in Jesus Christ. So we have an invitation. And then we're going to begin the process of assimilating that person into our church family. So... I like to think of it this way. When you lead someone to Christ, God uses you to bring that person to faith in Jesus Christ. That person is now your spiritual baby. They're your responsibility. They're your privilege. I mean, how many of you have ever gone to the hospital, gone to the labor of having a baby, and then walked out of the hospital, and the first person that says, Oh, that's a cute baby, you say, Hey, you want him? <laughs> I mean, we all know that's our baby. I mean, that we, 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 and in fact, if someone tried to take him away from us, that, the fight would be on, you know, that's, that's our baby. I believe God wants us to have the same attitude about our spiritual babies. So, the reason I use the word assimilation, how many of you like sweet tea? Okay, so does anybody ever serve you cold iced tea without sugar in it? Yeah, so when that happens, you tear off the, the sugar packets on the table, you, you put it in the, the tea, you stir it for about a half an hour, and, and, and then you watch all that sugar just settle right back down. That's not assimilation. You got the sugar in the tea, but it didn't get assimilated in the tea. It's not until the sugar disappears and it's no longer tea and sugar, but now it's sweet tea. Now that's assimilation. Same thing is true about your converts. Getting a person into church is not enough. They have to become assimilated into our church family. They have to actually become a, a, a part of us. It's been said that the average person won't stay in a church longer than six months if they haven't found at least five people in that church that they consider their friends. So your job when you have a new baby convert is to get that person to know and to associate with and to be friends with the people in this church. I don't know if you've ever noticed that we like each other here. That's a good thing. But sometimes it's hard to come in from the outside and get your way in because we all know each other, we all love each other, and we have to work at that. Sometimes we do the exact wrong thing. We, we can almost smother our, our guests when they come to church with us, and, uh, and, and nobody else can talk to them because, you know, we're kind of taking care of them so much. So your job is to help them get to know other people. You say, well, I can't even get them in church. How am I going to do that? Well, think about this. This is not the church. This is the church. So have them over to your house to eat. Have another family to come over at the same time. Get them to know people. And uh, when I led Michael to the Lord, I remember telling him, now, Michael, it's going to be real important for you to go to church. That's the way you're going to be able to grow. And I said, you know, you know Maria. And when you come to church, you'll, you'll know her. And he, this, I love this. He said, well, I know you now. If I get lonely, I'll just come over and hang out with you. And that's what I love about a four-lesson Bible study is that you really do get close to someone. You begin that relationship. They feel comfortable with you. 87% of people in church got there because a friend brought them. 
we, we have to recognize that discipleship and friendship look an awful lot alike. In fact, I didn't get to it yesterday, but in that um, chart of um, relational bridge building, the first one was conversation leads us to be able to introduce people to Jesus. But I also want you to be able to see is there were two other words, uh, and the first word was the word parakaleo. The second one was the word didasko. The word didasko, Greek word, means that we're going to teach. We get our English word didactic from it. It's that line upon line, precept upon precept. Would you agree that this church is really good at teaching? If you get people in this church, they're going to grow. The problem is hard to get people in the church, so how do we do that? It's the parakaleo. Now, parakaleo is a picture word. I'm good at, I like pictures. And so it literally means to call to one side. It's relational. And so the way, and by the way, you probably remember this. You probably heard the word parakaleo before because paraklete is the Greek word that is assigned to the Holy Spirit. Paraklete, not parakete. <laughs> and, and, and he calls us to walk with him. And just like the Holy Spirit comes alongside of us and walks with us, God wants us to come alongside of our converts and walk with them. Listen, discipleship involves teaching. But discipleship is not a course of information. Discipleship is a human-to-human -human relationship that builds a human-to-God relationship. And it's important for us to work at assimilating our converts into our church family. So do you see this logical progression between the four phases of our gospel presentation? We're going to use a conversation to get to the gospel. We're going to introduce someone to who God is, how to have a relationship with him. Then we're going to invite them to trust Jesus as their own personal Savior. When they do, we're going to immediately begin that process of assimilating them into our church family. Do you see all four of those? So I want you to memorize the words. But more importantly, I want you to understand the concepts. Because if you understand these four concepts, it'll be easy to remember the words. So we're going to use a conversation to direct the conversation to the gospel, we're going to introduce them to God, we're going to invite them to put their trust in God, and then we're going to begin the process of assimilating them into our church family. Can you say those words with me? Conversation, introduction, invitation, assimilation. Good, do it again. Conversation, introduction, invitation, assimilation. All right, so now that we know the basic pieces, I want to go and look at how are we going to explain who God is. And there are four truths here. You are familiar with them, so I won't spend a lot of time. God is holy. He can't tolerate sin. God is just. He can't overlook sin. God is loving and has reached out to us and made an exchange that we might be able to have a relationship with God. And God still be true to his holy, just nature. Because when Jesus Christ trades places with me, I now am holy and just because God, Jesus, traded places with me. And then lastly, God is gracious. He offers this salvation as a gift. How many of you look at those four truths and you say, you know, I'm a little more comfortable talking about God's love. I think I'd rather start there. Yeah, I get it. I understand. But think about this. When you tell your friend, God loves you and Jesus died for you, that makes perfect sense to you. They have no clue as to what you're talking about. Until they understand that God is holy and we can't tolerate any sin, it separates us from him. And if God is just, he can't overlook sin, he has to judge it, and the wages of sin is death. Do they understand that the death penalty of Jesus Christ was him dying in my place? I deserve that. And they have to understand the holiness and justice before the love of God makes sense. There's a logical sequence in there. You have to go in the right order for a person to be able to understand it. I haven't taken anything new. All I've tried to do is organize it in such a way that you can take the truth you already know and explain it to your friend in such a way that it makes sense to them. That's really all we're trying to do. All right. With that in mind, I would like for you to turn to page 65. And on page 65, we're going to be able to see 
a box with an outline in it, and then some teaching about that. There's 20 pages there, and we're not going to do even deal with all 20 of those pages tonight, but we are going to take that little box and demonstrate to you how to direct the conversation to the gospel. We're going to use four simple questions. And these four questions are going to become the building block of a conversation that directs that conversation to the gospel. In the middle of that gospel, or, or that conversation section, you're going to see, um, I'm actually going to this time be the Christian, and Anna's going to be the last person. Uh, we're going to turn that around uh, in the second one that we do, and she's going to be the Christian, I'm going to be the last person. But you're going to see, in the middle of that, I am going to um, give my personal testimony. Now, I wanted you to see this in your book. These are on pages 76 all the way through 81. On page 76, it begins to explain to you the three basic pieces of a testimony. Testimony is not what you would tell to the preacher to convince him that you are genuinely saved and can join this church. Now, the reason I say that is because most of us learn how to give a testimony that way. And frankly, there are code words we use. Do you know what I mean by that? If you don't use the right code words, he's going to start saying, are you really saved? I mean, that, because we're pretty serious about a, a, a converted church membership, and we, we want to make sure that people are genuinely saved. This is not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is your story of coming to Jesus. A story is interesting. Everybody loves a story. There's something that draws a person in. And there are three things that need to be a part of that story. Number one, I knew I needed something. And so basically, here's what my life was like before Jesus. And especially those of you who got saved as an adult, you're going to be able to point at the needs that you sensed in your own heart. And as you tell that to a lost person, you're going to see that the chords of your heart are going to uh, strike a, a response from the chords of his heart. It's kind of like if you, if you take this piano and play it and put a guitar next to it, you can watch the vibration of that uh, guitar because that's the way music works. And as you tell your story about what was going on in your heart, you're going to watch a response in the heart of your friends. So number one, the condition of my life before I got saved. Number two, here's how I came to Jesus. And frankly, all of us came to Jesus in, in a similar way, because we all had to recognize that Jesus Christ is our only Savior. And then number three, here's how my life changed. Now, you say, well, I, I don't even remember. Yeah, but Jesus did change your life. And today you are experiencing the benefits and the beauty of living with Jesus. And so you can talk about what Jesus is to you today. Now, on page 81, you're going to see a place there where you can write out your own testimony. Someone asked yesterday, can I write in this book? And the answer is, absolutely, please. So uh, I want you to write out your testimony, and then we would like for you to turn it into us. And because we have a lot of people here this week, I really would like to begin to get those tomorrow night because we're going to have enough time to be able to get through them and read them. And uh, we'll get them back to you and help you to be able to kind of think through how you're going to explain this. Frankly, the real benefit of doing it is not my response. The real benefit of doing it is you thinking through, this is how I would say this to a lost person. So the reason I explained that before and I, and I do our... Uh, demonstration is I want you to be able to see what that testimony is like when you're doing it. So as we role play, pay particular uh, uh, attention to the testimony portion, and you can see where that goes. Oh, I do have one more embarrassing thing to tell you. So in that outline that you see in that box on page 65, do you see that outline? There's a mistake in that outline. In fact, there's a mistake in every outline that uh, is in this book. I, I was very consistent with the mistake that I made. The word testimony is in the wrong place. It should be the next question down. 
So if you could think of it this way, we're going to ask the question, how would you describe your relationship with God? Your friend is going to answer. Then we're going to ask the question, what do you think it takes to have a relationship with God and live with him forever in heaven? Your friend is going to answer. Then you're going to give your testimony. And your testimony is going to pave the way to the next question, which is, are you 100% sure that your sins are forgiven? So I apologize. I don't know how that happened. I mean, we never mind. I won't tell you. Um, but but um, if you would just take an arrow and point it down, it's in the wrong place, and that will really help you to be able to get it in the right place. And hopefully, I'll do it right, and you'll be able to see it when you um, when you watch. All right. So Aaron's going to come, and um, I'm going to move this. Can I get someone to come and help me with this real quick? If you would just take that. Uh, off the platform. Anna and I are going to sit on the platform. We're going to do these chairs because I think it'll be a, a little, a, we're going to do chairs because we're going to be sitting down witnessing each other. Put it on the platform just because we want to get it up as high as we can. If you cannot, she's got a mic too, so I don't think we even actually need that right now. If you could just, when we sit down, adjust your chair to where you can see effectively, that would be helpful. Grab a GPS. So, role playing is fake. I don't know if you knew that. It, it, we're pretending. So, we're pretending that uh, one of us is a Christian and the other is lost. And that's what role playing is about. You're, you're just pretending, but you're practicing. And so, Anna and I are going to pretend we're going to practice. And um, there's, a, there's a difficulty in uh, us doing what we do, and that is that sometimes, especially in this first section, it's just a little awkward for um, us to be two different genders. I mean, because um, we're going to pretend that she and I are having lunch together, and I just want you to know I don't have lunch with women that I'm not married to, okay? I, I, so I, I, I know that that kind of bothers all of us, but we don't have anybody else to do this with, and so we just... We're going to pretend that the gender thing isn't an issue, okay? We know that it is, but we're going to pretend that. So she and I are at lunch. We work together. And as we're uh, talking at lunch, she tells me uh, a story about her son. And her son has gotten into drugs and alcohol. And she begins to let me know uh, that she is quite frightened for her son. And so that's kind of... I, I do that because rather than us fake all of that, that's, that's just a little difficult. We're just going to drop into this conversation. So the, the, the compelling part of the conversation, which we've gone from surface to soul, has already happened. And Anna has just uh, told me about uh, her son. And now I'm going to respond uh, to that, and we'll move on from there. Do you want to say anything? Okay. Well, I, I, do, I will tell you this because we forgot to mention this. Um, in just a moment, you're going to do role playing. So if you will just be compliant, so one of you is going to witness and one of you is going to listen. So the person who is listening and um, who is un the unbeliever, let's put it that way, be compliant. <laughs> I know it's really hard. But the reason is because we're not practicing all the different problems you could have in a witnessing experience. This is ground level. So just be, a, a, don't be a, a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness or a Buddhist or a, don't be an atheist or an agnostic. And if you have any questions, Jeff would love to answer your questions. But for this purpose, just be some de denomination or something that can be moved so that you give the person an opportunity to just go through the gospel. That's our ultimate objective right now. So men don't be angry. Okay, I, it's always the men who are the, the hard ones, you know. And so um, you can see the scenario. Um, Anna's just told me that she's frightened about her son, and my response is, you know, Anna, uh, we raised four children, and all of them struggled at one time or another. We had one particular son that really, really frightened us, and I, I really feel for you. I know how scary that is. And my wife and I will be praying for you and uh, really uh, take that very seriously. You know, when we went through our frightening time with our son, I, I just don't even know how we could have done that if, if it hadn't 
if we hadn't had God in our lives. I'm going to ask you a question. How would you describe your relationship with God? Well, wow, that's a big question. You know, Jeff, I just feel like God is so far away. I, I, I do pray, but I'll tell you what, I, I can't say my relationship with God is close because it's just not working. Yeah, and well, sometimes it's just things are happening so bad that it's just hard to support God in all of this. Let me ask you this question. What do you think it takes to have a close relationship with God to know for sure you're on your way to heaven? Oh, man, I, I, yes, that's troubling. <laughs> I think, Jeff, I, I just need to be in church. Probably that would help. I mean, I'm so busy, and uh, Sunday comes around, I just don't have time. I think if I were in church, I, th I think that would help me. Yeah. So... Be in church. Anything else? Well, yeah, there's a lot. I mean, I've made so many mistakes. Probably just need to be um, just a better parent. Um, you know that. You know that golden rule thing. <laughs> I probably need to do better at that. I, I get so frustrated and so irritated right now. Things are just falling apart. It's just hard for me to be what I know I'm supposed mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. Uh, you know. <laughs> When I was a little guy, I put my trust in Jesus Christ as my own personal Lord and Savior. And you never really know when a decision you make when you're young, how it's going to impact you when you're older. I've certainly went, been through many crises in my life, but I was in one particular situation where I was driving down an interstate, and uh, I, I just got off the off ramp, uh, but I was still going interstate speed, and I didn't realize it, but there was a there was a road that went across that off ramp, and uh, a person in a full size van ran a stop sign and was in that intersection when I came by, barreling by at interstate speed. I hit her, uh, uh, knocked both of us off the road. Uh, I. Um, uh, was started when I when I got back to my senses. I looked and there was steam coming out of my car, and I was afraid it was going to catch on fire. And so I I tried to get out of the car, and I realized that, that the car was damaged, and I was stuck, and I couldn't get out. And I climbed over the console, and in the process of doing so, realized that I was injured. And uh, when I finally got the other door open and stumbled out, I couldn't stand up. And I just literally had to lay there in that field waiting for people to come. I could hear people saying, hey, I think there was a wreck, and kind of hollering. And uh, I, I laid there for some time. Eventually, the ambulance came. They strapped me on a board. They rushed me off to the hospital. And during that entire time, I did not know whether I was going to live or die. But I, I, I had a perfect peace. I, 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 that decision I had made as a young person made a drastic impact on me as an adult, I knew that if I died that minute, I, I'd be in heaven. There was just a perfect peace in that whole crisis. Let me ask you this question, Anna. Are you 100% sure that all of your sins are forgiven and that you're going to heaven? 100%? <laughs> How could anyone be 100% sure, Jeff? I, absolutely not. I mean, I... I I know you're a good person. <laughs> I just can't even imagine being that good. Uh, Anna, if it were dependent upon me being a good person, there's no way I could be 100% sure. Can I show you a version of the Bible that I think would be very, very helpful for you? This little booklet has got all kinds of Bible verses in it. You can see them here in quotation marks with a reference behind them. This verse says, these things, talking about the Bible, have I written that you may know that you have eternal life. This verse tells us that God wrote the Bible so that we could know. In fact, it implies that God wants us to know. Could I show you from the Bible how you can know for sure you're on your way to heaven by a relationship with him? I would, I would like that, Jeff. That's it. We're, we're on, we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to take our gospel presentation and break it into six different chunks. And so what I wanted you to see just now is how we use these four questions to be able 
to direct the conversation to the gospel. So the first question is this one, and I would like for you to say it out loud with me, could you? How would you describe your relationship with God? Good. So obviously you have to get the conversation around God somewhere. And I find that if I can find, get a person talking about something that's going on in their heart, that it's pretty easy for me to refer to how God meets the needs of my heart and then just simply ask them. Let's do it together again. How would you describe your relationship with God? And I think you're going to find that that question is very, very helpful. It does two things. Number one, you're not just talking about God, but you're talking about a relationship with him, and that's going to get you to the gospel. This is not about getting information. It's about nudging a conversation towards the gospel. Let's do it one more time. How would you describe your relationship with God? Then we're going to follow that question up with, by the way, your friend might say, well, it's good, it's bad, it's indifferent. I, I love Danny's response. But we don't uh, always know what the other person is going to do. And uh, I love the response. You know, I just, he just feels so far away right now. And, I, that, and a person who's going through a tragedy and a difficulty, that, that sometimes is what they feel. And so it's, it's appropriate then to respond by just saying, well, let me ask you this. What do you think it takes? Let's do it together. What do you think it takes to have a relationship with God and live with Him forever in heaven? Now, obviously, you can't just memorize words and say them. You've got to put it into a conversation with your com having compassion. I love the definition the pastor gave of compassion this morning. And uh, you're, you're literally feeling with that person the struggles that they're feeling and asking them these questions. Let's ask this one again. What do you think it takes to have a relationship with God and live with him forever in heaven? Now, in between this question and the next question is where we're going to put our testimony. And I love this because we've asked them to describe their relationship with God. Then we've asked them what they're depending on to be able to have a relationship with God and go to heaven. And now we're going to tell them about our relationship with God. That's the way relate, our conversations go. They go back and forth. And so this is a very appropriate place for you to tell them about your own relationship with God and uh, your story. And then you're going to follow that up with this question. Let's say it together. Are you 100% sure that all of your sins are forgiven and that you're going to heaven? Good. Do it again. Are you 100% sure that all of your sins are forgiven and that you're going to heaven? Very good. When a person says no, and we're finding more and more and more often, not only do they say no, but they almost scoff at the idea that anybody could be 100% sure. And so the, the question usually is, you know, I don't see how anybody can be 100% sure. And, uh, and so then we're going to show them 1 John 5.13. God said them, and you can see I've kind of shortened the verse a little bit so that it makes more sense to the person we're talking to. These things, the Bible, have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. Uh, this version tells us that God wrote the Bible so that we could know. In fact, it implies that he wants us to know. May I show you from the Bible? how to have a relationship with God. Can you say that last one with me? May I show you from the Bible how to have a relationship with God. Can you do it again? May I show you from the Bible how to have a relationship with God. Now, in all of our role playing, what we're going to do is sit here and role play, and then I'm going to get up, and without saying anything else, I'm going to ask you to role play. To literally just turn to your neighbor right there to take your little GPS out because all of the, everything is right here. And, uh, and to just go down through it. This particular one, I find because every scenario is a little different and because you've never done it before, it is not a good way for us to start role playing. So I've just chosen uh, to, to not role play this first section. That's why I had you repeat the questions. I wanted you to at least get those questions out of your mouth and kind of hear yourself saying it. Uh, um, you'll have to practice this, this section a little bit on your own. Um, having said that, after I get you to practice, 
Then I'm going to say, all right, do you have any questions or comments about what we just said? In other words, what we're doing is I want to know, uh, as you look at uh, what we're talking about, how to get the gospel, conversation of the gospel, do you have any questions about how to do that? Do you have any concerns that, you know, boy, this is an obstacle I see in doing that? Uh, are, are there any comments about the four questions that we use? And um, I love, rather than me going through the 20 pages of explanation as to why we do what we do, I, I love having you just ask, make comments, tell me you disagree with me. Any, I, I always tell people, please let me know you disagree. There's absolutely no way I can convince you that I'm right if you don't tell me you disagree, you know? <laughs> So, um, any questions that you have or any thoughts about this? Yes? I have a question. You have us in this box. You have Titus 3 5. Why did you do that? Very good. That's a great question. So, sometimes um, when I'm asking these four questions, um, a person will tell me up here that they're depending on works. And then I say, are you 100% sure you're on your way to heaven? And they say, yes, I'm 100% sure I'm on the way to heaven. I can't use 1 John 5.13 at that point it, 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 because it doesn't make any sense anymore. So I use Titus 3.5, and I just say, you know, the Bible says not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Now, that's different from what you said. You said it was these things that you've done. And uh, the Bible says it's not the things we do, it's God's mercy. Can I show you from the Bible what the Bible says about how to know for sure you're on your way to heaven? And so we would use that as the alternative. Frankly, I want a no, I'm not sure answer. So, because it's a whole lot easier to, to do it. I mean, Frank, that's very confrontational, and I... I I, I don't like that. So I, I really want a, a no, I'm not sure. So I tend to ask the question, are you 100% sure that all of your sins are forgiven and you're on your way to heaven? And I find that most of the people uh, uh, say, well, no. In, in fact, if they say 99% sure, guess what I'm going to focus on? The 1% doubt. You know? So uh, um, that's why that's there. Very good question. Other questions or comments? Yes. Is it set up so that the questions are needing to be that length, or can they be chopped up a little bit, or you don't need to quite lead it all the way to the are you going to heaven, the sins forgiven part? Well, I, let me answer that in two phases. Um, one is um, I, I will show you tomorrow in a review why I have worded them the way I have, and, and I think you're going to understand why. Having said that, this has to be you. This, this has to be the way you talk. I, I do want you to understand why I do what I do so that you can understand the parameters. And, but, but this is your conversation. And if you quote my words in your conversation, it's not going to go over wrongly. So, yes, you have to make it you. Yes. Right. Well, here's the way I, by the way, I was saved when I was five. I don't tell people that because, frankly, it, it doesn't connect with them. And so I just tell, you heard what I say, I just, I, I, I got saved when I was a little guy. And, and then I tell an adult story. And frankly, Jesus did make a major difference. In, and I could tell that story a hundred thousand times. I could tell about a story that happened to me yesterday and the difference Jesus made in my life. So when I'm talking about difference, I'm not talking about this is what I was like before I was saved and this is what I am like now. What I'm talking about is the difference Jesus is making every day in my life. What life would be like without him and what life is like with him. And so we have a hundred stories that you could tell like that. 
Very good. That's a great question. And I think a lot of people who are saved when they're young struggle with that. Can I just say one more thing and I'll come back to your question? You probably doubted your salvation somewhere along the line. And the only reason I say it is because everybody who got saved when they're young did. I, I know. I don't talk about that either because what we don't want to do is, is tell people now, you, you're probably not going to get it right the first time, but let's work on it anyway. <laughs> so what you want to do is you want to be able to focus in on the impact that Jesus is making on your life and how you know you have peace from God because of it. Very good. Question over here. And um, that is going to be a difficult task. Um, but they keep saying the, book, the Bible was built by people. And I said, I understand that the Bible, uh, and I'll show you very, a, few, a few verses to try to teach them that God, to those people, wrote the Bible. That they are the only, the only reason why you can say that people wrote the Bible was because the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, was in them to write the Bible so that we have it for us. But I'm not, I, I'm not getting across to them. Uh, I think I understand your question. Let me see if I can help you with that a little bit. If we try to convince someone of the veracity of the scripture before we turn in the scriptures, we will fail more often than not. What I try to do is not prove to them that the Bible is true and then show them the Bible. What I try to do is pique their curiosity to get them to want to look at the Word of God. We, we know what the Bible says. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It's the Word of God that does the work. And so don't feel like you have to convince them that the Bible is true and then show them the Bible. Um, I, let me give you a story. My friend Carlton, um, when the first question he asked me, I just talked to Carlton the other day, uh, um, the first question he asked me uh, uh, 12, 13 years ago uh, was, so do I have to believe in this Adam and Eve stuff? to be able to have a relationship with this God of yours. And he let me know that he thought that God was a figment of weak men's imagination, that they created him as a crutch, that they needed this crutch because they were so weak. And uh, you know, I don't know about you, but when someone starts saying things like that, it's pretty easy to get mad. You know, you, you say, I'm weak, you know. And so we have to be careful. I took all that aside. And this is what I said, you know, Carlton, I could certainly see, looking from the outside in, why you would say that. And I understand. But imagine for just a moment that there really is a God and He really created humans. And that it's not weak men that need Him, but that all men need Him. You see, God, when He built us, made us to have a relationship with Him. And because we've separated ourselves from Him, it's left a vacuum, a hole in our heart. And nothing can satisfy that. I said, Carlton, you can, you can put success, materialism, sex, drugs, alcohol, but none of that will satisfy. Only a relationship with God can satisfy because God made us that way. And I didn't know this at the time, but Carlton was 35 years old, had reached all of the financial goals that he had for his lifetime, and he was sitting on top of his world. And he was sitting there thinking, is this it? Is this what it's supposed to feel like? So, and we, we can know that about every single person. We can know that about them because the Bible tells us it's true about them. And then, you know, of course, every time I would answer a question, I would answer it from the Bible. The Bible says. And I mean, if you heard the conversations that Carlton and I had, uh, it, it, the, the, word, the phrase, the Bible says, we've probably uh, uh, talked about a thousand times in these conversations. And, and he said to me, why well, don't believe the Bible? And so I, I just said, you know, I, that's really interesting to me. Let me ask you a question. What would you say the central theme of the Bible is? He hemmed and hawed and eventually said, I, I don't know. I said, well, Carlton, don't you think it's a little intellectually dishonest to say that you don't believe it and you really don't know what it says? 
I'm this poor lesson Bible study. <laughs> and, it, and it deals with who God is, how to have a relationship. It tells us what the Bible says about that. Let's you and I study it. And it, it you'll just be able to figure out at least what it is you don't believe. <laughs> and Carlton was curious enough and frankly honest enough that he said yes. And I wish I could tell you the whole story, but I'll just tell you this, that it took us three hours to do every one of those lessons because he had question after question after question after question. But after meeting with him three different times, he came to me separate from our Bible studies and said, I don't need to study anymore. I know it's true. I want to make that exchange you told me about. We can be confident that the Word of God will do the work in people's hearts that you and I could never do with our convincing arguments. So, good. I'm going to ask Anna to come back. This is, by the way, not the end of the conversation. We just we have to stop conversing every now and again to be able to get back to it. But when we get done, we'll, we'll uh, have more questions. So keep your questions out there. Just a, just a note, um, we do want you to turn your testimonies, to testimonies into us. So you can do that a number of ways. You can, If you write it in your book, you can just take a photo of it. And then you've got our email addresses. They're on your business card. If you'll email those, usually I'm the one who reads them, so you can email them to... I bet this week I help. Okay, yeah. Jeff will probably help. E either one of us. So that's an easy That's easy for us to do. If you want to just hand us a piece of paper, we'll give it back to you. Um, just, just whatever works. But if you do want to just write them in your books, you can email them to us. Some people like to type them out because it's easier for us to read them. Okay. Um, so if you want to do that, just feel free to email them to us. So this time, Anna is going to be uh, the um, uh, so winner, and I'm going to be uh, the last guy. We're, we're, this is better stereotyping uh, um, this way, and we're going to do um, the God is Holy section. Turn in your books to uh, page 85, and a couple of things I want you to see here in your book. You're going to see the box, just like you did on God. Uh, on the conversation section, but in addition to that, you're going to see a gray shaded area. The gray shaded area is the outline articulated. So in just a moment, you're going to be sitting in Anna's chair, giving the gospel, God is holy, to your friend next to you. And you're going to get stuck somewhere. So look down in that gray section, and you'll be able to see how to say what it is this outline is telling you. So the gray shaded area is really helpful. Actually, we could read along with it while Anna's talking and see if she says it right. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, this is just really designed to help people with what I believe is the most important thing in life, and that is their relationship with God. And you'll notice that it just talks about four of God's amazing attributes or qualities. And then it helps us to understand how we relate to him. So this first one teaches us that God is holy. And because he's holy, he cannot tolerate our sins. So the word holy, I'm sure you're familiar with what that means. The Bible, when, he, when it says that God is holy, it means that he is completely separate. He is unique. And specifically, Jeff, God is separated from all sin. God is perfectly holy. He cannot tolerate hmm. our sin. So I think here's a verse that helps you to see that. The Bible says that God is of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on sin. You could think about that verse this way. I think this will help you to understand what it means when God tells us that he cannot look on sin. Jeff, if you had sin in your life and you tried to enter the presence of God, God would have to remove you from his, from his presence because he is perfectly holy. And sin cannot remain in his presence. It not, it's not just that God doesn't like sin, but God simply cannot tolerate sin because he's perfectly holy. So then comes the question, well, if God is holy and he can't tolerate sin, then what is sin? Because, you know, people define sin differently. Here's a verse that helps us to understand from the Bible what sin is. Sin is the transgression of the law. Jeff's sin is when we break God's law. 
Are you familiar with the Ten Commandments? Yeah. I don't think I can quote them all, but I, I, yeah, I know them. Well, those commandments help us to understand what sin is. In fact, they go a little deeper than sometimes we realize because as we look at each one of the commandments, we understand that that commandment is a reflection of the character of God. So when we disobey one of God's laws, we not only break the law, but Jeff, we actually offend the lawgiver, God, the, the one who gave us the law. Excuse me. So here is a little chart that helps us to understand that. One of the laws is that we are to have no other gods beside him. So Jeff, when I put something in my life as more important to me than God, I offend that characteristic of God because he alone is God. Hmm, that makes sense. One of the laws is that we are not to commit adultery or to break our marriage vows. So Jeff, when a person breaks that law and they commit adultery, not only does that person offend their spouse, but Jeff, they actually offend a covenant-keeping God because what that law tells us is that God is true to his covenants. So when we break our co covenants, we actually offend a covenant-keeping God. One of the commandments that I think is really convicting, <laughs> convicting is that we are to not bear false, false witness or to lie. So Jeff, when you and I lie, we offend a God who is completely truthful. I don't know about you, but I know I've lied. A lie can be anything from stretching the truth to telling a whopper. <laughs> and I've done both of those things. Jeff, have you ever have you ever lied? <laughs> if I told you I had lied, I'd be lying. Right. <laughs> so yeah, I mean I'm like lies, right? right don't right. you think sometimes People lie because they're trying to help somebody? I mean, isn't that okay? Well, let me ask you this. Have you ever told a lie to help yourself? <laughs> Make yourself look better than you are? Yeah. 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 So, Jeff, when we break God's law, we offend Him. We offend the covenant keeping God. And that helps us to understand why, when you and I lie, it separates us from Him. So, that explains the emptiness that we often feel in our lives. Because God never changes. You and I, we lie, we steal, we do all these things, and it separates us from Him. And that explains the emptiness that many of us, wow. many of us experience. So, Jeff, you said that all of us have lied, and I think you're probably accurate. But one thing we know is that all of us have sinned, whether it be lying or adultery, whatever. All of us have sinned. And because of our sin, we come short of the glory of God. That last part of the verse, let me give you an illustration that helps us to understand what God means when he says we come short of his glory. His glory is his holiness, his perfect standard. So let's imagine, Jeff, that you and I, let's just put us at the edge of the Grand Canyon. Let's say that we're going to have a contest to see which one of us can jump across the Grand Canyon. <laughs> All right. So I'll let you go first, <laughs> being the kind person that I am. So, Jeff, if you're going to jump, how far out do you think you could jump? I don't know, 35 feet. 35 feet? <laughs> okay. That's pretty amazing. Well, Jeff, I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. I don't think I could jump 35 feet. So, you could jump farther than I can jump, right? Sure. But can either one of us jump the distance across that canyon? No, it's too far. That's how it is with us and God. There are some people that are a whole lot better than I am. Or there are people that, you know, when we compare ourselves to them, we might look pretty good. But Jeff, is there anyone who is perfect, who can com come to that perfect standard of God's holiness? Is there anyone? Perfect. No. And that's what God is telling us, that all of us have sinned, and we come short of the glory of God. So, Jeff, if, if this were the only truth we knew about God, who would be able to have a relationship with Him? Nobody. No, no one, because we all come short of His holiness. And that's it. So, 
what we're doing is we're just taking these pieces and just dealing with one of them at a time. What I want you to do is take that piece, so take the uh, conversation section we had and just kind of wipe it away for a minute. Right now I want you to focus on God is holy. And I'm going to give you about five minutes each to be able to explain God is holy from this outline right there in front of you. So we're just... I know it's, the very first time you do this, it just, just feels kind of weird, and just just try it. So you're just going to explain to them what holiness means, then this God's purity, you're going to have them see that first. I, there's two different ways of dealing with this. I tend to go from word to word to word, purity, uh, uh, intolerance, uh, um, dilemma, that's, that's the way Bra Jeff's brain thinks. She tends to go from verse to verse to verse, it just works better for her. So how do you do it? Just walk your way through that, explain it, and then we'll have a moment or two to talk about it afterwards. So go ahead and try that, and then we'll come back to it. Okay.